professors of American history from hmm. England. Like from American England. History. Yeah. They, you know, so they're kind of they're studying America as a foreign concept. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and I had a woman from Germany who her husband had visited you know, Kennedy's birthplace and now they wanted to visit huh. before he died on another trip. Mm -hmm. It was very unusual um, you mm -hmm. know, the diverse amount of people that I used to happen to grab off the street. And it's gone that way for 30 plus years? 30? What are we on? 30? 39. 39 to, to 40, wait a minute, it's 40 this year. It's 40 in November, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and then plus I've interviewed, you know, historians <coughs> and John mm -hmm. Cain, Michael Hazel and stuff, you know, just about the general history mm -hmm. of the plaza in Dallas before. And Great. It's going really well. Good. All right, so I'll, uh, you're all set. Okay. okay. Start this off, I ask people your name, where you live, and what you do for a living. That's a big question. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I'm Robert Deckard. I live in Dallas. Uh, do you want my address? No. <laughs> I, I live in Dallas, and I'm the uh, chairman, president, and CEO of Belo Corp. What all um, does Belo encompass now? We, we've become a fairly large company over the last uh, 20 years. We've been publicly held since 1981. We, of course, grew out of the Dallas Morning News and entered the broadcasting business early. <clears throat> um, suppose we began in the early 1920s in radio, then went into the television business in the early 50s. But until we became pub publicly held, really the company was Dallas-based. It was the Dallas Morning News, WFA Television, two radio stations, and some other assets we had around the country. In the ensuing 20 plus years, we've uh, quadrupled in size. Uh, the Morning News remains our largest newspaper. It's certainly the emotional heart of our company. But we also own the Providence Journal, which is the oldest continuously published newspaper in America, uh, the Riverside Press Enterprise. Then on the television side, we have 20 plus television stations around the country. Most of them we own directly. Some of them we operate through what are called uh, local marketing agreements or other kinds of partnerships. And then we are also in the cable news business and increasingly in the internet business through Beelow Interactive, which is a wholly owned subsidiary we started in 1999. Altogether, um, revenues are approaching 1.5 billion, and as I said, the Morning News remains the largest operating company among all of those. And so, at what level <coughs> do you kind of involve yourself? What does your job entail as far as how deeply do you involve yourself? Mm -hmm. my, my role is not unlike the role of, of any chief executive officer. It's to uh, determine policy, broad policies, uh, allocate resources among our operating companies and ensure that whatever operating plans uh, we establish at the beginning of a financial year are met or hopefully exceeded. Uh, I essentially report to the board of directors. Uh, they are collectively the men and women who ultimately set policy for any company, particularly a publicly held company. So the disproportionate amount of my time is spent working on corporate governance issues, board-related issues, and then those very uh, broad strategic and operating duties that I outlined. And so, besides the board, what personally governs you in deciding the direction of things? Well, what what the, do the, you look yeah, to as yeah. making your decisions? Um, First of all, let me elaborate on the board relationship. Uh, in, in a publicly held company, the board of directors hires and fires the chief executive officer. That is their single most important duty to the shareholders. Uh, and in our businesses, there is, at least in companies like Belo, a commensurate obligation to the communities that we serve through our newspapers, television news operations, our cable news operations, and our internet news and information sites. So those two duties uh, or responsibilities are felt very uh, strongly by our board of directors. It's one of the things that distinguishes our company, I believe, from many other media companies. And for me as chief executive officer, it is the single most important reference point uh, for me to make decisions on a day-to-day -day basis about the matters I mentioned earlier. How do we allocate resources? What kinds of aspirations do we set for our journalistic endeavors as well as our business initiatives? How do you marry all of those together in a way that respects our 
responsibilities to our shareholders and at the same time exceeds our responsibilities to our communities. Those men and women really are my, uh, my leaders, my role models, the people to whom I look for uh, advice as well as uh, instruction. And then within our businesses, there are certainly other men and women in my role in other companies uh, with whom I've had long relationships and with whom I discuss uh, the day-to-day -day kinds of uh, responsibilities we each have. How, how do we uh, balance between journalistic obligations and the need to have a prosperous business so that we can reinvest in our news and information uh, initiatives? Uh, you have to have uh, some kind of a mentor relationship outside of your immediate circle of uh, direct reports, and I, I have that both in the industry and with others in the uh, business and civic communities in Dallas, where essentially I've been all of my professional life. Switching gears a little bit, tell me your family relationship to G.B. Dealey. Uh, I am a great-grandson of G.B. Dealey. As you know, there were five branches to the Dealey family. Uh, my grandmother was Fanny Dealey Deckard, uh, and my sister and I are the two uh, grandchildren of Fanny Dealey Deckard. Now, among the five branches, as you know, there are varying numbers of uh, individuals in our generation, so that's influenced, among other things, how the ownership of the company evolved after the trust that controlled uh, BLO until 1976 dissolved. Uh, as fate would have it, we ended up being significant shareholders early in our lives and uh, therefore have had the privilege of playing a principal role for most of the last quarter century in the direction of the company and these very broad uh, policy and strategic decisions that are the province of the board of directors. She's a member of the board as, as well as myself. What was your I went to uh, St. Mark's School of Texas uh, here in Dallas for 11 years, went to Harvard College, and then came back to Dallas. Uh, our father had died when I was a senior in college, and my sister and I found ourselves in uh, a most unusual position of being in our early 20s and uh, having this very significant shareholding role. So essentially I, I made the decision to come back here rather than pursue uh, what probably would have been a, a journalistic career for at least some period of time. Yeah, you have worked in the paper at Harvard, correct? Yes, I was, I was president of the Harvard Crimson. And you planned going on to journalism there? Oh yes, I was, I, <laughs> I was actively seeking employment and, uh, and then our father became ill, uh, seriously ill our senior year, my senior year in college. And uh, I decided I'd better forego the, uh, the early 20s reporting stage and come back here. It was both of those things, uh, just commonsensically when uh, you and a sibling are the two largest shareholders in a company or are at that time uh, likely to become the largest shareholders. This was in 1972. The trust was scheduled to dissolve in 1976. It's incumbent upon one or both of us to become well informed about the company, its governance, its choices in terms of how we were going to transition ownership following the dissolution of the trust. So um, she at the time was uh, the mother of two young children and her husband was uh, moving up in uh, his legal career. So uh, it made sense intuitively for me to come back. And, and at the time, uh, we had a very progressive management training program at the Dallas Morning News, which I joined. So I had the opportunity early on to spend three years moving through the newspaper along with uh, a number of other people, most of whom ended up playing prominent roles uh, at the Dallas Morning News and more than half of whom were not family members. Uh, that's why I say I, it was really quite a, a progressive program which we now emulate on a larger scale in a much more complex corporate environment, but a lot of credit I think goes to the uh, leadership of the company at that time to be thinking uh, that in a far-sighted way and, and broadly about those matters. So who in your family, uh, of Jimmy Dealey's family, is still working for the company? Uh, of course, myself, uh, my sister and I are each on the board of directors. 
Jim Maroney III is the publisher and chief executive officer of the Dallas Morning News. And his father, who's uh, been retired for a number of years, uh, remains actively involved with the Below Foundation, which is our charitable uh, entity, uh, separate from the company in terms of, of uh, legal organization. But certainly having uh, Jimmy Maroney, the elder, involved uh, is wonderful continuity and uh, important for all of us from an esprit uh, standpoint. That's it. Uh, we've had uh, for 40 years almost uh, the belief that uh, anyone's welcome to apply for a job. If qualified, they're going to have an opportunity to uh, work at the company and then they need to make career choices as anyone else would. Uh, we have to, to think about uh, progression, career progression as a merit proposition, not as some entitlement because of family history or shareholdings. So a number of people have, have other than the, the two of us, Jim and myself, have been here and have ver had very good careers, uh, but for whatever reason have decided they'd rather do something else uh, along the way. Getting back to your great grandfather, mm -hmm. what did you know about him growing up? Uh, G.B. Dealey was talked about, uh, but, but in our family, our immediate family, uh, in a, um, uh, a, a more distant way probably than uh, most people would suspect, the, the five branches of the family uh, were close from the standpoint of, and remain close, from the standpoint of our common belief in the purposes of the company and the importance of perpetuating BLO as a freestanding company. Having said that, uh, once Mr. Dealey died and then subsequently Mrs. Dealey, his widow, uh, the family uh, each pursued, the five branches each pursued their own family lives. There were uh, some parties in the holidays where two or three branches would come together, but the gatherings that are recorded in uh, biographies of Mr. Dealey really ceased to occur after his death. Uh, the family encampments in Arkansas, for example, uh, were not things that were part of my youth or my sisters. Those things had all pretty well abated uh, in the early 50s. Can you give me kind of an outline of GB's life as you know it, and what do you think was kind of important? That's, that question has to be a long answer. Um, <laughs> Uh, but, kind of how, how yeah. he made his way. Well, of course, he, he made his way as a young immigrant. Uh, the whole country exists because of immigrants like G.B. Dealey. He happens to have been one of the most distinguished uh, in our state's history. And I think as uh, we look back uh, from a historical perspective, the influence of G.B. Dealey will be even more uh, appreciated by a broad range of historians and contemporary uh, leaders. Uh, his whole life was centered around uh, the Dallas Morning News, the art of uh, journalism, the practice of great journalism, and engagement with community in the most constructive way possible. His interests were very Catholic. Uh, he had a passion about urban planning, which is well documented. Uh, but he also had a passion about history, and as a result uh, was a founder of the Dallas Historical Society. Uh, he pursued an intellectual life and organized uh, regular groups of his peers who would discuss literature and current events and history. Uh, he had a lot to do uh, with the evolution of our library system in Dallas. He was uh, intensely interested in education and helped uh, the creation of Southern Methodist University and, and advanced the idea of public education, both the secondary and college level, and on and on and on. Um, I think his, his leisure, if you will, his hobby, was the city of Dallas and the state of Texas more broadly defined. He helped find the, found the uh, uh, Texas Philosophical Society. I think actually the name is the Philosophical Society of Texas, but on a statewide basis, he uh, tried to evidence those same uh, priorities in terms of how he spent his time and encouraged others who influenced our city and the state to spend their time. 
Uh, he also put his resources behind it, uh, the resources of the company, the risks he took uh, with some of the bolder uh, journalistic and editorial uh, positions of the Dallas Morning News. Uh, he put his personal uh, financial uh, wherewithal uh, somewhat at risk in helping create parks and open space and things of that character. Uh, he, he was, by all accounts, an extraordinary man, a genteel man, uh, at the same time, a very determined person. You cannot accomplish what he accomplished without being uh, determined as well as farsighted. So the things I know about him uh, since he died four years before I was born, five years before I was born, uh, really are through the eyes of historians and somewhat through uh, anecdotal family stories, but, but far more through the eyes of historians, which I think is, again, a testament to him because those tend to be more object objective views uh, of the man. Um, you'll, you'll note there are no autobiographies by G.B. Dealey. Uh, it, that was not the way he saw his uh, legacy being created. It was through deed and initiative and history's view of those deeds and initiatives. Oh, mo most of them are pretty well told in the in the literature. Uh, you know, the acts of kindness towards individual employees during the Depression, um, both in terms of uh, financial support and emotional support. Uh, certainly, the the risks he took, uh, most famously taking on the Ku Klux Klan. But there were there were numerous other uh, news and editorial stances that he took w that were. Uh, not very popular and perhaps even unpopular. Um, his daily naps, things like that, but, but not having uh, been alive when he was and, and, and had an experience with him as I had the privilege of having with my maternal grandfather, it, it's hard to, to do more really than recite what's in the, in the books that have been written about him and the, and the articles. Rarely. Um, I think about it, and I, and I mean that not in a uh, flip way. Um, I, I wanna, I've had on a to-do list for a couple of years uh, getting our family together and just walking Dealey Plaza and the neighborhood, which is now beginning to be a bigger and more interesting neighborhood. But uh, if, if the question is, do I go to Dealey Plaza and re reflect? No. Um, He's, he has Dealey Plaza well under control. Doesn't need me down there uh, stargazing. We did, uh, I think you know, that um, uh, one of the only additions to the plaza uh, in, since its construction is the installation of the two flagpoles, uh, which were dedicated to my father. So in terms of family impression, that was a, a very important day for my mother, for my sister, and for me, and, and for our immediate family. Uh, ironically, that happened in what I would characterize as the best way possible, which is to say a friend of my father's took the initiative without our knowledge and somehow cajoled the city of Dallas into doing this. Um, but the plaque that's there, I think, is a, a pretty good summary of my father's life as well. It's off to the side, uh, uh, to the north and west of Mr. Dealey's statue. No, I, I, there, I have no melancholy about uh, Dealey Plaza at all. I, it's, it's only uh, only positive things because that's the manner in which it was created, not strictly by G.B. Dealey. It was a classic example of an initiative he supported, uh, facilitated, and then ultimately uh, was credited with having uh, helped uh, bring to fruition. Uh, if you think about the sequence, it wasn't something where he went to the city of Dallas, said, I want to give you this land and name a park after me. It was almost the inverse, and the, the naming uh, for Mr. Dealey, which he is reputed to have resisted, um, uh, occurred later. Um, 
I think the truth is, like all of us, uh, he appreciated being recognized in, in an appropriate way at the appropriate time, and that was the uh, the pinnacle, in my mind, of the, the deserved recognition uh, he was given by his fellow citizens over most of uh, the last half of his life. Uh, by the time he was 50 years old, he had already accomplished a great deal, and in the ensuing 30-plus years, uh, became probably uh, the the single most influential person in Dallas quietly, uh, and when recognized, he responded with uh, humility. So I, I see Dealey Plaza as a wonderful um, reminder of the influence uh, an extraordinary man had on a city as it grew uh, through the first half century and then the next quarter century of its life uh, in a very important way. So I celebrate Dealey Plaza, and I, I, I don't look back on history and wish it were otherwise. Uh, things happen in a lot of cities and a lot of places for reasons that transcend our understanding and the fact that the president was assassinated in Dealey Plaza is a fact of history, which thankfully our city finally uh, found a way to recognize and, and um, acknowledge in an appropriate way, which is the role of the Sixth Ford Museum and I think today a role, not the only role, for Dealey Plaza. Uh, it's a fairly typical uh, recollection for a Dallas site. I was in school. Um, we were in a math class. The uh, intercom uh, came on and suggested that the faculty, uh, I think, uh, probably go to a, a, a meeting, which was unusual in itself. And then the teachers came back and got all the students, and we went to the school's chapel because by that time uh, the president was already dead and the news reports had uh, reported as much. So we had probably been in class during the, the time from the guns being fired to the president's transport to Parkland Hospital and so forth. Uh, so this chapel service was conducted and then school was dismissed. And uh, like most Americans and certainly virtually every Dallasite, uh, I went home to mourn for uh, several days, and, and like all uh, Dallasites, again, uh, probably watched 20 hours of television news for the ensuing five days. Um, you also went down to the hospital to visit the governor, did you? Well, I went with my parents. Um, my, my parents were friends of uh, Governor and Mrs. Conley. Uh, as you know, he was gravely wounded, but by two or three days, uh, following the assassination, he was well enough to, uh, to see some visitors. Uh, my parents uh, took my sister and me with them. We didn't see Governor Conley, but we were at Parkland Hospital in, in a waiting room. There were a number of other people there, security people, so it was not as if we were the only, uh, only people visiting. It was very brief, uh, but it uh, made a, a powerful impression on all four of us. It reminded us of uh, the tragedy of what had occurred, uh, the serendipity that uh, the governor wasn't killed, uh, and yet the, uh, just the, how awful uh, a day it was for our city and our country that uh, two men of that stature could be gunned down in a public plaza. Uh, it's uh, probably that single idea more than anything else that explains why this is such a powerful memory for Americans of now three generations and people all over the world. Um, did you kind of realize your family's um, kind of importance at that point, or your family's connections, or were you aware already of um, who your parents were friends with? Oh. Um, in our immediate family, uh, meaning my parents, my sister, and myself, the connection to the company and to the Dallas Morning News was something that was uh, known and acknowledged but not discussed a great deal. Uh, our family life did not center around my father's role at the Dallas Morning News or, or Below Corp to the degree there was a separate corporate um, uh, office at that time. Uh, they were very intent on my sister and, and I 
growing up leading normal lives and uh, for a whole range of reasons. Uh, therefore, we're pretty disciplined about separating uh, our family life from the life of the company. Certainly, that was a revealing experience that uh, this could happen. Uh, the Dallas Morning News was uh, a part of the story, as you know. Um, I probably was aware that my parents knew Governor and Mrs. Conley, but uh, surprised to find myself at Parkland Hospital, uh, I know that, uh, that uh, they were that close. I, I think it wasn't really that they were so close, that, but that my parents felt uh, an obligation as friends and as citizens of Dallas uh, to, to pay a visit and uh, express not only our, our regret uh, for what had happened to him, but our regret for our state and our country generally. Uh, that's a uh, that's a, an interesting dimension of the life of companies like ours. You have a personal life, you have a company life, and then you have this public life, which is not always uh, understood in, in many companies, including ours, uh, never emphasized. But but we feel a very deep obligation to community in that sense. Really, that's what was going on when when we went to Parkland Hospital. How um, how much did that Well, of course, our last name not being Dealey, we weren't uh, as directly associated in the minds of friends and acquaintances. Uh, certainly, my sister's first name being Dealey uh, caused people to think again about uh, what connection might exist, and there was, there was some of that, I think, not a lot, uh, for her to, to contend with. But I, I don't think that our feelings really were much different than the feelings of most people in Dallas. It, it was a sense of great sorrow, um, uh, regret beyond description, uh, but unlike uh, the external view of it, uh, not, not shame. I, I, I was never ashamed of Dallas as a city. I was never ashamed of the Dallas Morning News. There was a lot of, a lot of press about you know, the, the, the shame that had uh, come upon Dallas. The shame was for a time in our country's history where things could be so dyssynchronous that we had some of the incidents that preceded the president's visit, and we had uh, a situation where a lone assassin or more than one assassin uh, were moved to, to, to do something so brazen and uh, so destructive, not just of the, the people who were hurt, but of our, uh, our country's democracy and sense of equanimity. Those things, I think, were felt very heavily by all Americans and particularly by us in Dallas. Uh, and we then were confronted with these conflicting feelings in a lot of different ways uh, when we traveled in this country, when we traveled overseas. Uh, as it happened, uh, our family, my immediate family, went to England and Ireland uh, and then to Germany and Switzerland the next summer. It was our, our, the European tour uh, my parents had always aspired to, to take with my sister and myself. And we, and we found um, in several places a great deal of resentment toward Dallas, which was hard for me to understand because this idea of, 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 of shame and guilt was more about a few people and a circumstance in, in our country, not about Dallas. I mean, the idea that a city of hate, what does that mean? Uh, there's no such thing. And the, the fact is there have been equally tragic things that have occurred in other cities around the world for all of time. And, and I, I just felt a sense of unjustness that for whatever peculiar set of reasons Dallas was being characterized in this way, whereas that had not occurred in, in similar situations in other places and at other times and didn't subsequently. So as an adult, I had a lot of uh, conviction about the city uh, addressing retrospectively 
some of those conflict, conflicting emotions, and, and uh, we and our company have, have, I think, done a lot to find some um, equilibrium about all this over the last 15 to 20 years. How long did you notice that last where people would hold something against you just from being from Dallas? Uh, my guess is there are pockets of resistance <laughs> even today. Um, but I think they're very, very uh, rare. Um, I've said many times that uh, of all events, who would have thought the television program Dallas could deflect attention from the notion that we were a city where people hated. Um, but that, that happened. Um, I, I, I cannot remember watching a full episode of the television show Dallas. and. Uh, some of our television stations made a lot of money off of the show Dallas. But what it did for our city in ways none of us could have anticipated is it created a different cachet about Dallas, whether it was hokey or not is beside the point. It caused people in this country and abroad to think of Dallas uh, in a way different from their feelings that, that were uh, really founded, rooted in the assassination. And concurrent with that, uh, the Dallas Cowboys became a phenomenon. Uh, again, I'm, I'm not the biggest football fan uh, in the neighborhood, much less the city or the country, uh, but it is, in retrospect, it is quite remarkable how those two things together helped the country, and uh, particularly Europe and the UK, uh, get past the feelings that, that were very real and uh, in evidence from 1963 until sometime in the mid-70s. Uh, those, those 10 to 12 years were, were pretty tough on Dallas. Um, the first public thing done for Kennedy assassination was the Kennedy Memorial. Yes. Was Bilo involved in all? I don't, I don't believe that we were. We, we may have made a modest contribution. I'm uh, reasonably sure we would have uh, said something favorable about it on our editorial page. But not having done the research, my uh, suspicion is that we were um, not overly enthusiastic and did not take a leadership role. Many people in the city's uh, civic community and, and amongst our civic leadership were very conflicted about how to deal publicly with the assassination. Uh, so while Stanley Marcus and Eric Johnson and others deserve great credit for causing the memorial to be built, uh, took longer than it should have, but, but they got together enough of a consensus uh, to proceed, uh, it was not there was not a unanimous sense that we needed to do this, we needed to do it promptly, and we needed to do it as well as possible. In fact, um, to this day, I regret that uh, Philip Johnson's design uh, was not fully realized. It was supposed to be in granite. It's in cast concrete and you know, so forth. Uh, but I think the site is a good site. It's prominent. It's uh, been visited by millions of people over almost uh, 30 years time, I guess it was finally installed in the early 70s, uh, should have been sooner. Um, what is your personal feeling about the memorial? About the memorial? Yeah. Does it strike you in any way in particular? I, I, think, I think the Kennedy Memorial is very appropriate. It's uh, beautiful in its simplicity. Uh, it would be virtually impossible, in my opinion, to put in a few words all of the emotions and dimension uh, to what occurred in November of 1963 and all that followed. Uh, so I, I, I think uh, having a simple marker with the president's name and a few words and, and the solitude and um, almost uh, confinement uh, that you feel inside the more it's very peaceful and that's the way it should be. Tell me about uh, Bilo's involvement with the, uh, what was the sixth floor exhibit at first. Mm -hmm. we, um, we, we had become frustrated in the 
early 80s uh, and into the and towards the, the middle of, of the 80s that there wasn't an appropriate acknowledgement in the heart of our city that the assassination occurred here, uh, that it had the kinds of very broad implications that it did have, not just for our country and our city, but for the entire world, uh, and that there was a, a deep and uh, almost universal continuing interest in the life of John F. Kennedy in this country and, and abroad. So for us to have that mantle, that uh, responsibility, and not having addressed it uh, in our minds was a very serious issue. Uh, the approach, as you know, was for the private sector uh, to be in charge of uh, remembering the assassination, which equated to three or four uh, hokey storefronts operated by well-meaning people uh, that had more uh, inside for uh, bumper stickers and uh, assassination conspiracy theorists uh, than uh, any semblance of acknowledgement of what the president had done in his life and what his accomplishments had meant for our country or what his death had in turn uh, meant for the whole world. So we um, uh, had some discussions, uh, and by we I mean Jim Maroney and I and some others, uh, with the county judge, with the leaders of the historical community, and resolved that we needed to do something uh, that was appropriate, uh, sophisticated, comprehensive, uh, and extremely sensitive uh, to all of the feelings, to all of the dimension uh, of the event that came to be known as the assassination. Keep in mind that at the same time, all of the uh, assassination conspiracy theorists were in full gear. Uh, their, the Warren Commission's work was being uh, picked apart. Uh, there were all sorts of theories being advanced. Uh, Oliver Stone was about to take the field with uh, the movie version uh, that came a little later, but the, the, the makings of that were all um, all around us. And, and that, to me, made it even more urgent that we do something. Uh, so. Uh, Dave Fox, who was the county judge, Lynn, Lynn Adams, who was then the head of the county uh, historical commission, myself and two or three others, devised a plan uh, to take the sixth floor of the county administration building, which thankfully had been bought by Dallas County. Uh, there was a chance that it, it could have been uh, demolished. And to the county's great credit, they made it the seat of the commissioner's court. That, that too was a choice. They could have bought the building and made it a, a warehouse. Uh, instead, they purchased the building and made it the seat of county government. Uh, symbolically and in so many other ways, that was an extraordinarily, extraordinarily important decision. Once that decision was made, our opportunity was to do something fitting on the sixth floor, uh, to do it in a way, as I said, that was comprehensive, sophisticated, and very sensitive. Uh, and so we got the, the money together to do that. The county agreed to make the space available. Um, most of the financing uh, came from the private sector, uh, some from the county. And we came up with a business plan for the 6-4 exhibit, uh, which suggested that we might have positive cash flow in uh, the early years, but had very conservative projections about attendance. Uh, we also chose the word exhibit on purpose. Really, it was a historical exhibit. That was the concept. Uh, we believed at the outset that creating a museum implied certain things. It implied that we were creating a memorial to President Kennedy, which already existed, uh, that it was a museum only about his life and times. There was a presidential museum being built, so that, that wasn't our role. We believed what Dallas needed to do was acknowledge all of these events in the most appropriate way possible. And for us, that meant a historical exhibit that took into account all of these broad themes and, and events and dimension. Uh, so when we set about the task of, of actually programming it, we hired one of the leading historical exhibit designers based in Washington, D.C. Uh, and asked them to take that approach. 
I believe it has served us very well. It's been curated beautifully over the years. It's been expanded, as you know. And along the way, the, the name was changed to Museum because, uh, frankly, from a marketing standpoint, it, it made more sense to the public, which was fine once we had had it in place and you could take someone there and say, this is what it is. When we were envisioning what it should be, though, we wanted to stay away from anything that would in any way uh, limit our ability to uh, have a, a, a truly high quality uh, result or create controversy or deflect attention from the purpose. So that, that's why we chose the name a historical exhibit. Uh, of course, once it was in place, the crowd started coming. I, I don't know that it mattered what we <laughs> called it. Uh, and, and we've uh, had the great benefit of uh, choices about how to use the, the cash flow, the positive cash flow to curate the exhibit, expand and do things that I think none of us really uh, thought were possible, would be possible when we set out to, uh, to build the exhibit. So you're happy with what's happened? With I'm, I'm very happy with it. Personally, our company uh, is um, gratified uh, by the work that began with the group that I identified and, and many other men and women have taken up and, and, uh, and developed further. Uh, the administration of the exhibit, now the museum, has, has been uh, superb. And to see the expansion uh, to the seventh floor for traveling exhibits and the prospect now that Dealey Plaza uh, will be restored to its uh, intended uh, grandeur and, and some of the spaces on the north and west side of the School Book Depository building perhaps uh, acquired and, and drawn in uh, to the whole experience. These are, are remarkable outcomes. So yes, I'm, I'm very pleased and as I said, our company and our foundation are gratified. Uh, well, like most 12-year-olds, uh, uh, I was uh, impressed by the heroic quality of John F. Kennedy, uh, whether it was uh, his life as a PT boat commander or as a politician and ultimately as the president. Uh, he was all the things we know him to be. He was extraordinarily bright. He was uh, charismatic almost, certainly dynamic. Uh, he knew how to lead people. He was a brilliant speaker, an inspirational uh, speaker, uh, and he gave the aura of uh, representing a whole new generation of leadership uh, in our country. So uh, even in a city that uh, was uh, pretty divided in the 1960 election in terms of people of voting age, uh, for those of us who were in our early teens and mid-teens, uh, President Kennedy was was an inspiration, and that's the way I've always uh, always looked upon him, uh, even as uh, history in its uh, deserved uh, revisionism uh, reveals things about uh, his life that uh, weren't apparent at the time. But uh, as a boy, I had I had read Why England Slept for Heaven's Sake, his uh, his thesis that was converted into a book, uh, and was just fascinated by him. Uh, of course, when you, when you ask the question, how does John Kennedy's presidency compare, immediately he's at a disadvantage because his presidency was so short. Um, my belief is that history will always view him as one of the most dynamic presidents of the 20th century, but there's really no uh, legitimate case to make that he had the impact of many other presidents, including Lyndon Johnson. Uh, were it not for Vietnam, which is a big were it not, uh, Lyndon Johnson would probably be viewed as one of the most important presidents ever when you think about what he did domestically and in social programs and civil rights. Uh, forget how it happened from a political standpoint. Uh, he did that. 
he was the president. He caused those things to occur. Um, I think uh, President Kennedy's biggest mistake will be viewed as Vietnam. Uh, that was him and his cabinet, inherited by President Johnson, uh, and it, like his assassination, was a, a watershed uh, event for our country, politically and personal terms, emotionally for our company. Uh, so, you know, 50 years from now, I'm, I'm not sure that the substance of his presidency uh, will uh, match up as we might think it would today. Uh, but certainly the approach he took to the presidency, uh, the cabinet he assembled, the, the universal or uniform brilliance of the men and women uh, who surrounded him uh, will distinguish his presidency for a long time to come and should. I think, I think the, the, you, you answered the question. I mean, when you're 10 years old and impressionable, um, someone like John Kennedy makes a, an enormous impression. Uh, my guess is if I had had the unlucky experience of being uh, 10 years old in 1933, Franklin Roosevelt would have been even more inspirational because he said to a country that was near the brink, I'm going to bring you back. And, and, I want you to trust me and follow me, and those who did were rewarded. That's quite extraordinary. Uh, so how you evaluate a president has a lot to do with where you are in your personal life, your personal experience, your age. Um, uh, so I think I, I'll, I'll buy your answer on that one. Um, you touched on Oliver Stone coming here. Did you mm -hmm. ever watch his final film? I didn't watch one minute of it. First of all, I, I do not believe in any of the conspiracy theories that have been advanced. Um, secondly, while I respect uh, the need for um, filmmakers to take on any subject in any manner they feel is appropriate, personally that film, the idea of that film was, was troublesome to me, uh, mostly I think because of my personal experience. and. Uh, similarly, anyone who had, had been in Dallas in 1963, uh, whether you were 12 years old or 22 years old or 72 years old, uh, JFK was a tough film from what I know of it. Um, and I, and I, I just, um, having it made here in Dallas was, was very uh, unsettling to me. I was, as a matter of fact, in my office the day they recreated the assassination, I had to leave. It was a, a weekend, and you know they staged the motorcade, and they, right out here on Market Street, and uh, every 20 minutes they'd roll and turn the corner, and guns went off, and I, just, I called my wife. I said, "I'm, I'm going. I don't know where I went, but uh, I wasn't going to sit here and listen to that all over again." What do you think about kind of the conspiracy subculture that's developed in the you know, vendors out there? free country. I mean, if, if you want to live your life uh, surrounded by conspiracy theory, whether it's this conspiracy or the hundreds of others that we've uh, promulgated, supposedly promulgated in our country, that's fine. I'd, I'd rather spend my time more productively. So I, I, I don't pay in any, any mind. And, and it's, uh, it's, it's a almost uniquely American phenomenon. If you think about it, uh, how, how many cultures or societies around the world have subcultures around uh, conspiracy theories of any kind, much less with a marketing promotion, uh, almost distribution channel mentality? It's very American. What do you think the future holds for Dealey Plaza? Do you think people are still going to be visiting it 100 years from now, 200 years from now? I do. I, I think that uh, for reasons that uh, are really beyond our full comprehension, the, the site, uh, the buildings around the plaza, 
the event itself and all of its tragic dimension uh, have captured the interest of people all over the world. And, and once that occurs, intuitively, it passes from generation to generation. Uh, otherwise, how could you explain any number of, of uh, destinations around the world for travelers? Uh, it's because families have been there and they remember and their children here or their school teachers been or the film. I mean, the, the, the body of uh, literature and film and television documentaries on this subject uh, is extraordinarily large. And when you then put that in a 2003, 21st century uh, video distribution environment, uh, these are materials that are going to be instantaneously available to people all over the world. So rather than uh, the way the world was in 1963, where you had to wait for CBS to have a documentary on its coverage of the Kennedy assassination a year later, uh, this is going to be real time on the internet. If someone says, well, what about that thing in Dallas? Boom. It's going to be on a, sc on a screen. This interview will probably be on a screen somewhere. And, and, that, and that's fine because it helps us, uh, all of us, reconcile ourselves to these kinds of seismic events that inevitably happen uh, through the course of history. It's not the first event of its character. It hardly will be the last. Uh, once the identity, though, of the location and the surrounding events is established, I think it's very hard to, uh, to dislodge. Um, the Ambassador Hotel is being torn down in Los Angeles. But the fact is that never became a site visited by the general public, admirers of Bobby Kennedy or historians or conspiracy theorists, that, that never really went on there. Um, so just as the Ford Theater has survived, I think Dealey Plaza will uh, exist, certainly exist in its current form and probably be uh, a place of great interest for a long time to come. Have you uh, personally, I imagine, met presidents? I have. Which ones? Uh, President Johnson. Uh, by now, meet is a big range. I mean, I've, I've met and, and known some, President Johnson being one. Uh, I've met others more in a handshake environment, President Carter. I've met and known President Ford uh, through business and civic activities after his presidency. Um, met President Reagan, met both President Bushes, uh, know them reasonably well. Uh, met President Clinton in the receiving line on a couple of occasions. Um, president, I, well, now that I think about it, I've, I've met every president since John Kennedy. Do you s still feel that there's a, a disconnect with the fact that there, this is a president, or do you see them as a, you know, a person? Um, the moment someone's elected president of the United States, they become Mr. President or Ms. President for the rest of their lives for me. That, that may not be true for other people, but uh, President Bush is the president. And uh, when I see him next, I will call him Mr. President, and I will call him Mr. President for the rest of his life when I'm uh, fortunate enough to, to be in his presence. And I feel the same way about uh, all of his predecessors. That respect, uh, deference even, is a part of our democracy and, and needs to be, um, if anything, it needs to be underscored because the respect we all have for the office translates to how we all in turn respect our democratic rights. Um, so sh of course someone uh, becomes another person in terms of that part of a relationship, the respect and deference that uh, the office uh, deserves and in a sense bestows upon the person holding the office. I also believe that uh, men and women do not change in their basic beliefs uh, or behaviors uh, late in life and, and presidents are elected fairly late in life uh, by our own constitution. 
So they're the same human beings in a job with extraordinary pressure, uh, and they deserve the respect and deference that our democracy bestows upon them. Thankfully, though, they remain the same people. Do you mind uh, sharing your political affiliations? My political affiliations, they change all the time. No, I, I am a genuine independent. And uh, yeah. why is that? Partly it's how I, I view our own democracy. I, I, I find it hard to believe that uh, a great democracy uh, can be one-dimensional in terms of party or ideology. Um, at different times in our country's history, the Republican Party has best served our companies, countries, our companies, our country's needs. Um, and just as the Republican Party serves our country's needs best at one time in our history, the Democratic Party has served it better in uh, another time. Demands change. And, and I think that many Americans think this way about our contemporary democracy. Uh, think about how political conventions have changed in the last 40 years. Think about how few people vote a straight ticket anymore. Uh, the well-documented disconnect between voting patterns in, for, for congressional elections versus the presidency. There, there's nothing uh, one-dimensional about it, and there shouldn't be. So my belief is you evaluate every situation of its own merits. You vote for the best person. You vote for the best idea if it's a referendum. You vote for the best proposal if it's a bond election. But you vote. Uh, and it's, a, it's, a, um, it's escapism to say, well, I can only vote for a single ideology in this democracy. I know there are many people who still do that. Uh, but I, I subscribe to George Mitchell's belief, which he expressed when he retired from the Senate, and that is most Americans prefer to live in the middle, and that's where I prefer to live. I'm interested in your take on why the South in general is was staunchly Democrat and now is kind of more to the Republican side. Did you have four hours? <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, I mean, that, that question really does go back to um, the early 19th century. I mean, you have to look at the, the emergence of, the, or the precursor for the industrialized uh, society that uh, took root in the Northeast and the Midwest and to as far west as St. Louis originally. Um, that created a certain uh, political preference, if you will, think about the immigration patterns, uh, the size of the cities, the nature of uh, the workforce and politics and ultimately business and commerce. Uh, that created one uh, set of ideas about how uh, local and state and federal elections should, uh, should go. Uh, a whole different set of expectations in the far west as we uh, explored and discovered the west. And in the South, uh, before the Civil War, uh, there was uh, really, I think, a, a, with the exception of two very important issues, uh, a view that was uh, fairly consistent with the view in the Northeast and the Midwest, but it was ripped asunder by the Civil War. Uh, and as a consequence, the Democratic Party emerged in its then current ideological form, which is not the same as today. I mean, really, the ideology of the Republican and Democratic parties in some respects flipped over the course of, a, of 200 years. Uh, so, uh, I mean, I, I, I could pull out all of my old history books and start citing references, but that's a big question, which I frankly was not prepared to answer today. Um, uh, you, do you know uh, more specifically the story of why uh, former Governor Conley decided to leave the Democratic Party? Well, now that's a more contemporary story, and um, I mean, Texas, Texas politics reflected the politics of the South with a distinctly Southwestern uh, edge or dimension. Uh, 
my grandfather on my mother's side was a lifelong Democrat. He was the mayor of El Paso, the speaker of the Texas House of Representatives, the prominent member of Congress uh, uh, through World War II and subsequently a federal judge. He was born a Democrat and died a Democrat. But his economic beliefs are very similar to this great middle I described and what's happened in the last 50 years in the South and in states like Texas is that both parties have moved into that space and then separated again on ideological basis. So I think as the, the West has developed, as migration to the Southwest and West has occurred, many people who are uh, progressive minded happen to be Republican because they're more conservative on certain ideological matters, but on fiscal matters, they can find a lot of common ground with former Democrats who are also uh, migrating, if you will, towards the middle. So uh, when the, the National Democratic Party in the 50s and 60s and early 70s tended to, to move to the liberal end of a ideological spectrum, it caused individuals in states like Texas to find that middle and then associate with the Republican Party, which had come off of an extreme ideological uh, position to capture that middle. And now, as all things cycle, we're cycling in a way where the Republican Party, I think, is actually becoming more ideological, more conservative, uh, and will probably push some of its members to the middle. And that's what's interesting about politics. It's what I said about earlier about certain parties in certain circumstances are going to do better uh, depending on how the body politic reacts. But, but clearly the shift in the state of Texas from the early 60s when Nixon carried the state and feelings were very raw between the Democratic and Republican parties has evolved to a remarkable degree in 40 years' time. That's not a long time in, in a historical perspective. Oh, um, I don't. I mean, I don't have any personal insight into why the governor changed parties, but it, it, you're exactly right. It was a, um, uh, a seminal moment in Texas politics. Uh, but, but I think it, it really was just a matter of his, his uh, greater comfort with the economic and ideological policies of the Republican Party in contrast to what had become nationally, on a national level, those same policies of the Democratic Party. Being a Democrat in Texas in the early 1950s was quite a different thing than being a Democrat in the early 1970s. It was more centrist, both from an ideological and, and uh, economic policy standpoint. So you take a, a man like John Connolly with a strong business background and a centrist view particularly as the Vietnam War uh, escalated and the, all of the uh, well-documented conflicts nationally uh, took place, he gravitated towards what he, he saw as a more uh, amenable uh, ideology and, and a economic philosophy or policy more consistent with his own. What is it that I like about Dallas? Would, you live here? Um, would I live here? Yes, absolutely. In fact, my, my wife and I have talked about that on numerous occasions. Uh, Dallas is a great city. Uh, it is underappreciated in many respects uh, outside of uh, our own uh, near uh, neighborhood of North Texas. Uh, but the, the qualities of Dallas that uh, have defined the city are still present. Uh, there are many, men, there are men and women in Dallas who are ambitious for the city and its people. Uh, they are um, very assertive about doing what is best for the city. They're willing to expend their own time and resources to create an environment where our community can prosper, where businesses uh, flourish, uh, where good education is expected. 
and where you can raise families and uh, live uh, actually in political terms uh, a very centrist kind of, of existence. Um, what I like further about the city is that it remains a modern city. It's maturing. Uh, we are becoming a very complex urban uh, area, particularly the city of Dallas, but that brings with it a lot of excitement as well as challenges. Uh, we have a very attractive uh, fiscal foundation, uh, which is credited to the men and women of G.B. Dealey's generation who set the policies about how we're going to create the financial structure for the city of Dallas, for Dallas County, and by extension, I think all of the, the cities that now comprise North Texas, they read off of uh, the standards, the financial, fiscal standards of the city of Dallas. Uh, that has served us in very good stead because we have really not had a modern fiscal crisis. We've had some budgets we'd like to uh, improve, uh, but uh, when you have that kind of financial foundation paired with a large number of men and women who are ambitious for our city, for themselves and their community. Uh, that is the envy of cities all over the world and even some of our strongest competitive cities, competitor cities uh, in the United States. When I think about what has changed in our city in the last 30 years since I returned, uh, it's quite astonishing. Uh, ideology has changed, centrum, centrist, kind of thinking, progressive thinking, uh, has taken root very broadly. Uh, we've been able to deal with most of the complex urban challenges that have presented themselves, and we have done things that are um, quite remarkable, whether it's the Arts District, whether it's uh, the Dallas Arboretum, uh, whether it's the economic engine that Dallas-Fort Worth Airport represents. Uh, whether it's our transportation systems, which while not perfect are certainly progressive for a city like ours that's, that's, that has no boundaries where automobiles uh, are the uh, God-given right of every citizen. Uh, our environment has been treated fairly sensitively for a city of this size. We have great opportunities like the Trinity River, which is perhaps going to be realized after nearly a century of discussion. Uh, we have uh, businesses that think of their duties, their responsibilities beyond uh, their profit making and their shareholders. It is quite a remarkable uh, environment. Um, it's, it's, it's an all for one kind of attitude to a degree greater than most cities of our size and complexity. We should celebrate that. We can take great advantage of it. Uh, and it means on an individual basis, it's a very amenable lifestyle. Uh, and I think that's true not only for people who have a lot of resources, but the, 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 the girth, the broad girth of our community, and increasingly we need to, to enable those with lesser resources to enjoy the same benefits that this city can afford. Uh, many cities are dealing with endemic problems that will take decades to solve. Uh, we're, I believe, emerging uh, in a very healthy condition from two decades where we've had to deal with some pretty serious setbacks. Uh, as I call it, the quadruple witching hour in the 1980s. We lost the banking industry, uh, we lost the real estate industry, we lost the oil and gas industry, and we lost the insurance industry within the same five years. And the city's stronger today than it's ever been. Very few cities can make that claim. And we've rebuilt substantial parts of all four of those industries. So that kind of, of, of determination and aspirational thinking uh, will serve us in very good stead for a long time. How much do you think that Dallas is a reflection of the legacy of GBD? Uh, um, I think G.B. Dealey, where he's sitting here, would disclaim a lot of the credit. Uh, my belief is that historians agree that he and a small number of his peers defined the city as we know it today, set in place the framework within which many people have built our city over 
uh, a century's time, and also created very important expectations about the way we conduct ourselves as citizens. Uh, that this is a place that honors and respects integrity, uh, will not tolerate abuse, and increasingly as we welcome more and more people to the city of Dallas and the region, uh, sets a standard by which we can all uh, evaluate uh, our personal investment of, of time and emotion and, and financial resource uh, in ways that are available to very few cities. So. I think he deserves a great deal of credit. There are other men and women who also deserve credit, but it is a small cohort, and, and he's at the front of that cohort. And then, uh, just you know, coming here from Minnesota, I'm really, uh, I've been to most states, I'm really surprised that Texas is, you know, I see the Texas flag everywhere, and um, I've never noticed such a pride mm -hmm. in, in any state. What do you think it is that sets Texans apart? That's a big question, too. Um, what I know is that you're right, that there is a, a certain pride that exists in Texas. It's palpable. Uh, it expresses itself in uh, both sophisticated and unsophisticated ways. Uh, the unsophisticated ways it expresses itself probably define our personality more than we realize. Uh, I, I think part of the magic of uh, Texas has been uh, the fact that for 200 years, this place, this geography, has combined a frontier aspect with great economic opportunity. And what brings those together is the social and political uh, fabric of the state. Uh, part of it's the luck of the draw. I mean, you, you don't create uh, the King Ranch and uh, Big Bend and the Piney Woods and the Panhandle and the Red River and all the history that goes with it. You couldn't have dreamed up the Alamo if life itself depended on it. I mean, people talk about the Alamo all over the world. It, you say the Alamo, it means something. It's part of vernacular in, in many languages. Um, so those antecedents then combined with the economic opportunity first presented by the Gulf Coast and then by the railroads, then by the, the arability of seemingly unarable land, thanks to water, uh, created the, the ability to, to build all this infrastructure, build these cities, very dynamic, modern, can-do type uh, places, but we never lost the frontier dimension. You could, Dallas in its earliest days, you didn't have to go far to find the frontier. Uh, 50 miles west of Fort Worth, you're in West Texas. Uh, the hill country, you just go on and on and on, and, and, and what that is, it's like an incubation uh, phenomenon, phenomenon uh, so that in modern uh, expression, you have great universities like the University of Texas at Austin, and a great uh, music uh, scene and industry in Austin, Texas. Uh, those things don't happen because someone called a meeting and said, let's have a music industry. It's all, it's organic. It's, it's happened as a result of all of these things. Uh, and in today's world of uh, instantaneous communication and great marketing uh, sticks, uh, that shtick has taken the whole uh, pride of Texas and escalated to something quite different, which, frankly, people from outside Texas are attracted to. You know, I'm, I'm a native Texan. I own one pair of boots, uh, which I wear once every six years on the occasion when I have to go to something where I have to wear boots. I don't own a pair of blue jeans. I have no aspiration to ride a horse. I've done that. Um, but, you know, people show up from Minnesota and, you know, it's the Western warehouse get me the horse. I don't understand it. it it's great. Wouldn't exchange it. Lastly, is there anything I've neglected to ask you or something that you'd like to make sure? Boy, that history question, that was a, that was a, a brain number. I'm going to have to go work on that one. Uh, I'll get back to you on the history of the South. No, I'm, <laughs> I enjoyed it. I actually have to go, and uh, I, I hope this goes much. well. You bet. Thanks to both of you.